Hello, I am Katrick and today I'm making this video for the Construct2 Academy. Today we are making an inventory example. It's a very simple implementation of an inventory. So our inventory works as displaying items on screen and as you can see it's controlled via the mouse input and when we put the cursor over an item we do have a display of the name. When we move the cursor of our mouse to the top of the screen, it displays four inventory cells, that is the in inventory. At the moment it is empty, and if I go over to an item and click it, the item is moved, placed into the inventory cell. When the item is selected, it displays two icons that allow us to interact with the item. For example, the X cross there is to drop the item from the inventory, so you can see that it's moved back to its original position on screen. When the inventory is full, we are trying to store one more item, a message is displayed to let us know. And that's where the fact of dropping an item can be useful to make some space for another item. We can select and select items by simply clicking them once they are stored into the inventory and the second icon is the icon to use the item or have an interaction from the item with another one. As far as I've built it, currently if we click the U icon we have to select another item. If I select the wrench for example it's doing nothing, but if I do try to have an interaction with the letter B, the letter B disappeared and the letter A was changed to the letter C. It's the results, the result of the interaction between the letter A and the letter B is the letter C, which is a new item. And if I select it, you can notice that there isn't the U icon. It isn't made to be interacting with another item, but I can drop it from the inventory and you see that it's placed in the position the later A was in, but it's displaying the later C and the letter C name as well. The letter B, the second item from the interaction, was destroyed. We can check another interaction, the hammer well, is made to interact with the wrench. The wrench has been destroyed, the hammer has been modified and it's giving us a black square. And if you are trying to interact with items which are not meant to be, it's simply back to unselecting the item and just having your regular cursor. So now let's see how the project is set up. For this project, a lot of sprite objects are used. One object, and one of the main objects, is the inventory cell. As a sprite, simply displaying a single frame. The important is that it has an instance variable, order, which is numeric, and goes up to 3, allows me to know the order of the cells from left to right. 0, 1, 2, and 3. Another sprite is the item. Item instances are being picked thanks to their animation frame, so in this case, we do have different animation frames, up to 9. It contains all our objects and start with the frame 0, which is just blank. Items have more instance variables than the inventory cell. The first is the in inventory, which is a boolean variable, allowing me to know whether the item is on screen or whether it's stored into the inventory and displayed inside an inventory cell. Through the project, I do use the INV letters when I'm referring to the inventory. It's in capital letters and it always means inventory. Name is an instance variable of text type. It's simply containing the name of the item. Start X and Start Y are used to know where to place the item back on screen when we are dropping it from the inventory. A sprite object is used as selector. Simple field color 
of Opacity 24. It's moved to the relevant cell or out of the screen as needed. Two sprites objects act as the icons, use item and drop item. They do have both. The order instance variable is going to be in relation with the inventory cell it's being displayed on. The sprite object is used as the cursor and is made of two animation frames. Notice how the origin point is set to the tip of the index. The inventory hitbox is yet another sprite, which is a field colored rectangle stretched over the screen. An opacity of 15, but actually the sprite is invisible, and we use it to test a collision when our mouse cursor is over it to know if we have to display the inventory or not. It has a Boolean instance variable named showing that is used to allow us to display the inventory even if the cursor is not overing it. Note that all the sprites except for the items and the inventory hitbox are on the inv layer. So we do have two layers in our project. That's it for the sprite. Other objects we used is the mouse. The mouse object is used to handle the user's input. We do also have arrays to store some data. An array is a collection of cells in the computer's memory. Together, they form a data structure. The cell can contain a value, which is either a number or a string of characters. Each cell has an index, a numeric value used to reference it in the array. Those are its coordinates. Horizontal axis is named X. The vertical axis is named Y. For arrays, a personal preference of mine is to start their name with the A letter, to know that it is an array. We have two arrays in this project, one of a single dimension, X. It is the inventory itself, A in. Each cell of the array corresponds to the visible cells of our inventory. The value stored in that cell refers to the animation frame of the item store. So the value 1 to 9. Another array of two dimensions, X and Y, is the A item list. This array contains data regarding the items themselves. The X coordinate refers to the animation frame of the item. For this implementation, the X coordinate 0 is bypassed, so our data starts at the coordinate 1. The Y coordinates contain several data. The coordinates go from 0 to 2. This is what you are going to have as values into the memory of your computer. And for us to understand what the array exactly contains, I've set this array with each X coordinate referring and displaying what item it is referring to and also what animation frame it is referring to, what item it is interacting with. The item 1 is interacting with the item 4. Item 4 is the B letter. And both their results in the item 7, the letter C. And the name of the item 1 is the letter A. Back to our project, a sprite font object named txt item name is used to display the name of the items when the cursor is placed over an item. Text object txt full inf is using a fade behavior and is used as a warning feedback message for the user to know the inventory is full when clicking an item on screen. Finally, we do have a function object which will allow us to organize the code and break it down into specific mechanics. I broke down the code a lot in order for the theory of the mechanic and implementation to shine through. We have three major groups of code. One deals with the user's input, and the second is a main group divided into two groups, the functions dealing with the logic of the inventory, what the input is supposed to do, and the GUI displaying what 
the input is supposed to do. So our logic is separated from how we display it to the user. Each group contains several functions and several events. The input relies on regular events. Logic functions will likely call GUI functions to display their results. In Construct 2, event sheets are read from top to bottom. For each event, the conditions of the events are tested and if all the conditions are true, the actions of that event are executed and then the program goes to the next sub-event to again test its conditions on and on or to the next same level event. The conditions also allows us to pick, select specific instances. When conditions pick only a set of specific instances, then the actions of the event are only applied to those picked instances. Then, the actions of the event referring to the object type are only applied to the picked instances of the current object type. You can learn more about this into the Construct2 manual. We start our program with the onStartOfLayout event, which is used to set the size of our array A inv, inventory array, setting its x size to 0. The array is currently empty and no cells exist in it. On the other end, the other array, A item list, has a definite size 10 x cell and 3 y cells and it is filled manually thanks to the actions we have next. And it's in regards to the content of the array as I've shown you earlier. At this point, the content of the array looks like that. And in the logic we have implemented in the project, those data actually means this. And I've decided to create constant global variables and use them to remember what each y coordinates refer to in a more human readable way. And those constant variables can be seen into the event sheet itself. We do have interact with, results and item name. Once the data are filled, we called an initialization function that will pick the name from a item list array and assign it to the correct item instance. We set the start x and start y x and y position of each item. This action without prior picking from any condition do apply to all the instances of that object type. So each item will take its own x and own y position and put its value into its own start x and start y instance variable values. And we finish up with some display and GUI initialization. The group inputs deals with mouse object events mostly, since it is our main input. We have stuff happening when the user puts its cursor over an item or over the inventory it box or when it's not. And so it's calling specific functions. Both calls GUI functions that deals with displaying the name of the item being overed or displaying the inventory itself. When the mouse is not over the inventory and the inventory is not set to be displayed, drawing is equal to false, we hide the inventory. Displaying and hiding at this point is simply done by setting the layer of the inventory in layer to visible or invisible. Going into the hide inv function, which is a GUI function, there, hide inv, set layer inv layer to invisible, and display inv, inv layer is set to visible. Another available input is to click an item. Clicking an item is the most complex event. It is because it depends whether the item is on screen or stored already in the inventory. It also depends on whether we are supposed to click an item to get it, select, unselect it, or select the item to interact with an already selected item. Remember that in all following sub-events, the item instant construct we will consider in all the tests is the item instance that was clicked. 
Thanks to the conditions in the sub-event of that event, the correct functions are called. Notice how, when clicking an item, we mostly go through logic functions, and some of those functions will do the job of calling the GUI functions. Also, at this point, we have broken down the intent of the player's input, and directed our code towards the appropriate logic functions. Let's now go focus on those logic functions to see exactly what they are doing. When we click an item that isn't yet stored in the inventory with the intent to place it in the inventory, we call place in inventory. To store an item logically, we create a new cell and store a reference to the item in that new array cell. Then our GUI engine, if you want, displays the content of the array on screen. Let's have a look at the GUI function display inf content, as a lot happens in it. It is a function that is often called to visually update the results of some logic modification, adding a new item, dropping an item from the inventory, having two items entering with each other, creating a new item, are reflected and updated on screen thanks to that single function that is called whenever needed. I leave up to you the fact of looking further into this project and find out exactly how everything is implemented, although it should be straightforward enough from there to navigate and understand the code. The ID is pretty much the same all over the place. The user uses his mouse to input an action, we clarify the intent of the action and redirect it to a specific set of logic functions. Those logic functions modify the current state of the inventory and the scene. Then GUI functions are called to display the results of those modifications to the user. From there, it is up to you to determine what items you want to make what interactions you want your game to propose, and you are not forced to separate the logic from the display the way I did. You can also use this separation to add even more display effects. Instead of just an appearing inventory all of a sudden, you can make it drop down from the top of the screen and then scroll up when you hide it. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Don't hesitate to check out some of the other Constructor Academy material. Thank you for watching.